Hi. Hi, Anya. How's it going? How are you? How are things? Good. Good <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, I don't know why I need to be recording already. Um, in, in, in recent uh, years, still relatively new, so it's still a work in progress. Um, so I'm going to slide, go through the slides here and just give you a little bit of a uh, sense of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, so uh, quality of creative places. So it, it is basically an ambition within our uh, strategy, 10 year strategy, making great artwork um, and called out specifically in our first three year plan. So um, it really, which really began as, you know, establish a creative places program. So we had to kind of figure out how do we do this <clears throat> um, when we hadn't done anything like this before. Um, and it really is a commitment to, to ensure that more people in Ireland can, can enjoy, take part in and benefit from brilliant arts experiences, no matter where they live and particularly in the places where they live. Um, it was a response to research that we did around the spatial and demographic um, distribution of our funding. So in terms of looking at uh, where, our fun where our funding was reaching, but more importantly, where our funding was not reaching. And, uh, and, and looking from that perspective on who was not benefiting from um, kind of sustained opportunities in, in the arts. Uh, so we did that whole piece of research to really kind of look at, at where our scandal funding was going and not going. And aligning that with the national development plan and 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 uh, particularly around their uh, vibrant communities and and uh, exciting places to live. Um, so it is a national program, um, and but very much operated and built up from from the from the ground up from the local participants. <clears throat> So, um, like I said, it's about a long-term investment in places that have few opportunities to take parts. Uh, it's, it's about an approach that is inclusive, it's diverse, uh, rooted in that socially engaged arts practice and also community development principles uh, and building on those existing cultural strengths um, within those communities already. So it's not, you know, it, it, it's, it's not, you know, recognising that there is probably lots happening in those areas. There might be town bands, there might be choirs, there might be amateur dramatics, there might be lots of things happening for young people. But, you know, on, on a voluntary community level, but they've not had that support <clears throat> to bring it to the next level and, and really uh, create new opportunities and reach a broader uh, uh, community demographic. And, and really it's to kind of build um, those programs in a way that, that equips those communities to keep going with, with those uh, projects um, and recognising the benefits that they may have um, for the wider community and economic benefits that might it might bring as well. So how do we start? We started with a, with a research um, approach um, and identifying. So we looked <laughs> to identify pilot town. Um, look again, looking at that spatial distribution of our funding, and we mapped all the towns in Ireland between the population of three thousand and ten thousand. And there are seventy three towns in Ireland of that uh, of that size. Uh, so we looked at every single one of them. <clears throat> so we did this in 2018, summer 2018, with a, um, a deep dive into this. Uh, we looked at those towns and to a number of different lenses. So were they in receipt of Arts Council funding or sustained local authority funding? Did they have an arts centre, did they have arts festivals? Was their population decline? Did they maybe have rapid or poor public status? <clears throat> and how many deaf schools were in those towns as well? And then we divided those towns out by uh, regional assembly areas. So we looked at the Midlands and East, uh, Northwest and the South. Um, and from that process of, of measuring, I suppose, if you like, um, we shortlisted two towns in each of those regional assembly areas. And then we looked deeper then at the percentage of diverse population in those towns and the numbers of young people. So kind of looking more at our council uh, priorities and around, around our funding as well. And from that, we then <clears throat> identified our Pilot town, which is Chum. <clears throat> so we uh, started off um, having a conversation with um, with uh, Galway County Council and said, "Look, we're interested in, in piloting a project like this. We've done this research. Chum is the town that comes up as, as meeting the these criteria, um, and uh, they were very open and very, and very welcome to uh, developing this with us. Then we entered into a discussion with the people of Chum." Uh, before we did anything, you know, as we said, we're, we're interested in doing this, we're interested in coming to Zoom to partner with you and to develop this project. Um, and we had a couple of public meetings um, there, listened to what mattered to people and what they were interested in themselves. And then we said, OK, let's uh, let's move ahead with this and, and we had a better understanding ourselves of what, what mattered to people to whom that we could help shape um, what the I suppose, tender for project management might look like. Um, so that was um, all done in 2019, and then we 
procured credit to um, project manage uh, the Creative Places June project, and we launched it in January 2020. And since then, it's been it's been fine. Now you notice launching in January 2020 meant three months before pandemic, um, or less than three months before pandemic. So within uh, you know six weeks of the coordinator Carl Lamb being on the ground in June, we were in lockdown. So there remained a massive challenge as well to how do we pilot you know a Creative Places project when we couldn't be in the place, um, and. Carlan really did uh, the Trojan work in terms of you know, building those early conversations she had in those uh, initial six weeks, and then continuing those conversations over over lockdown, um, and 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 you know change the program up a little bit in order to try and and uh, I suppose work with the realities that we were facing with COVID and the challenges that we're facing the community as well, and, and creating new opportunities for the community to come together in new ways, um, online and in other ways. And, and also working with the artists in the area, uh, which is really important to, to, I suppose, build that community of artist support um, who would be ultimately the ones you know, delivering a lot of those projects on the ground. Um, we, if we take a closer look then at what happen, has happened in Tume over those and how, how Caroline has been measuring uh, the work there. Um, and so there's been five artist residencies, there has been 56 local businesses that are taking part currently in a grow, Going Up Town project. Um, there have been six Oristar community conversations online and in person. Uh, 86 artists have engaged in the project to date, uh, which is really phenomenal reach um, as well. Um, 60, 660 cups of tea. I think this is a great stat because it really indicates you know, the amount of occasions that have um, that Caroline has created to build relationships, share ideas, to meet people, and every conversation leading to a new conversation. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, Staff uh, there really indicates you know how these conversations start over cups of tea. Um, four hundred eight local participants have taken part in uh, fifteen different workshops over the last two and a half years. Uh, the thirty eight community groups have been connected into the project, and uh, twenty seed seeding funding awards. And those awards were you know to local community groups to to kick off projects over lockdown. And to think of new ways of how they might work um, in, in during that period as well. So the likes of you know a choir got funding to, to do a virtual choir project, uh, and, uh, you know, and various other uh, Thai towns got funding and you know to do something creative as well. So there's loads of different um, interesting ideas, and all those groups were supported uh, to make their projects a, a reality as well. Um, so hang on, next one. So since uh, Chum. We started the pilot in June. Um, you know, we've looked at you know, I suppose additional funding into the Arts Council also meant that we could expand the program. Uh, so since 20, since we started June, we have now expanded into 12 places, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so now we've got, <clears throat> and we can kind of categorize into those who've now on, on three-year programs. Um, so including Tune there, we've got Bagnellstown, um, Darndale in Dublin. Asai in Kildare, the West Cork Islands, um, even Derry and Offaly, Bolton Glass in Wicklow and Tipperary Town. The Bolton Glass and Tipperary Town being quite recent uh, additions to that programme. And there are those who also are, who can opt in for a research and development phase, so not quite ready to, to run with the full career programme, um, but uh, are interested in exploring what that might look like. So we have a number of research development towards there in McGulliam in Talla, um, Shannon, Clare, the Eva Plantstown and Kerry, and uh, Loughness Town Valley Brack area in Dublin. Again, that's been the most recent one as well. They're, they're just kicking off their project. <clears throat> so we've learned lots, you know, and we're, we're still learning. Um, and importantly, what we're doing, so all these spaces are not in isolation of each other. Uh, they're part of a national network as well. So um, they all come together, they kind of, of peer support and learning, and, uh, and we put in place uh, some uh, mentoring projects and uh, networking opportunities for them in, in person. First one in person coming up in, in November, um, being hosted in Tume, um, and they, they will move around the places in terms of network, you know, the different hosts at different times. So it's still really what's happening is that it's, you know, it's about each, each of these awards allows for a coordinator to be to work on the ground and they um, are working three to four days a week in, in most places um, and they are building those relationships and they're listening to what matters to people and building programs based on that. Um, so it's, it's hard to kind of, you know, one of the things that we're most often asked um, is, well, what does a Creative Places program look like? <clears throat> 
well, it's each, it's bespoke to each place. So we've not ever put a kind of parameters of what a pervasive places project should look like. It's really down to the local community to really uh, create that for themselves um, and, uh, and to build those relationships and partnerships um, with others as well to help sustain the project going forward. Um, I think the next one is the audio. Is that right? Hang on, I'm going to click to that. It is. So <clears throat> what I wanted to share with you because you know is, is a voice from Tume. Uh, so I, I can tell you about it. But if you hear from somebody who who is has a lived experience of a creative places program, um, I think it's really important. So the audio clip that um, Nicola is going to play for you there now is from Joanna McGlynn, and uh, she's recorded this as uh, her reflections on the creative places program. It's seven minutes long. Uh, we can share the whole link to people afterwards words but um uh we're going to show just maybe share about two or three minutes but thank you Nicola. Going into town on a friday and catching the market down brown's lane it's as much about the chat as it is the fresh locally grown organic vegetables home baked breads willow witch and free range pasture grazed pork going home with my wares maybe into tools to pick up a few bits or little for the big shop New harmony to fuel my latest health ad and parks when I'm looking for that something and I'm not sure what it is, but I know I'll find it in there when I see it. It's breakfast in leaf and bean, followed by a stroll to the library, maybe a book or maybe catch an exhibition in the foyer. It's Viennese fingers from the cake box, if I'm lucky, shared over a couple with a friend or neighbour. It's orange, the handmade chocolate shop. It's the sound of kids playing in the park and families on bicycles. It's young people hanging in closed doorways, laughing, dreaming, all talk about their futures. Covid happened. The market ceased trading. The cake box closed down. The library doors shut to the public and leaf and bean went click and collect. Young people still gathered in doorways, laughing, dreaming, all talk about their futures. Covid happened, but something else happened too. Since Creative Places came to town, my tomb is all this and more. My tomb is curious. It's reading the announcement of 20 seed funding recipients in the social media channels of a national resource organisation and realising this is happening in tomb, my tomb. Delighting knowing that throughout the hinterland and studios and workshops through communities and collaboration, there's a network of practitioners experimenting, making and producing. The announcement is followed by news feeds of new websites launched, podcasts released, musicians recording, craft fairs continuing and suddenly the seeds are growing, the creative endeavours of a community supported, made visible, taking root. I am witnessing a place being held. That's the privilege Creative Places has honoured Toom with, holding a space, deeply believing in a place and its people. That's brilliant, Nicola, you could pause it there. You know, just does not take up so much of your mm -hmm. the time and allow others to go there. But um, after this, I'll pop the, the full link into the chat as well so people can just uh, hang on to it and have a full listen back to the whole thing uh, from Joanna. But I think it's always important to final word uh, come from uh, one of the residents of our creative places. That's, that's great. Thank you so much, Sinead. Um, I just want to ask if anyone has any questions for Sinead while we have her here, you can just raise your, the easy, you can, yell it out if you want but there's also a raise hand function and you can drop it in the chat and um, i'm just wondering what the future is for the program what are you thinking for the longer term or is that uh officially on paper yet um so the 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 longer term is 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 to keep going with it you know we've we've published um a um our spatial policy which is a place place and people um earlier this year and uh great places is very much going to be you know uh, one of the programs that will animate that um the, that, that policy so we are in this for the long term um our aim is to build incrementally each year so adding two three new places each year um it's still modest enough you know in terms of of that but you know um i think it's important that we i suppose don't uh, 
overstretch ourselves and overstretch everybody else uh, with it, uh, but just to you know build it slowly and learn uh, incrementally and, and how it's working um, and, and tweaking each time. So if anyone is interested in, in you know, the next round and I'm making an application for any of the, I, I've got a place in mind that might suit a project like this, um, uh, where it will be springtime next year when we're accepting new applications. Mm. And is there, um, how like how small a community, how small a place? I know you're saying it really depends on the application, but I mean, how small a community, what's the lowest amount that you'd accept? What population size would you be interested in? Yeah, well, we haven't set those parameters necessarily within. So while, while our initial research was towns, we expanded our thinking up now into what a place is. So you'll see on that list, there's some urban spaces and there's some very rural places <clears throat> as well. Uh, so the Ebro Peninsula being very rural, part of Kerry, the West Cork Islands, there's um, seven West Cork Islands that are inhabited <clears throat> and their population base is very low. You know, and that population mm-hmm. decline is very much part of that. Um, so. It's it not, it, you know, we're not necessarily uh, defining whether a minimum and a maximum of of, uh, of people to be in a place, but uh, more to do with um, the, uh, you know, I suppose the opportunities or the lack of maybe opportunities that those places have had to date and, and, and the partnership that needs to come together locally to make mm-hmm. um, that project sustain in the future. That's great. And um, would you be, um, I know you have your spatial strategy in the Arts Council to look at how you are kind of supporting a broad range of communities across Ireland to develop their arts practices. What happens if there's um, maybe an interest in going with a community that's quite close to a community that's already taken part? You know, is that something that you'd be looking for a spread of new projects? Yeah, certainly a spatial spread <clears throat> is something that we are looking to. And you already see there's quite a cluster at the minute in, in the Leinster area. So in mm-hmm. High, Eden Derry and Bagmanstown are not that far, both that's not that far from each other. Um, uh, but if also if we're looking at the minute, like if I draw a line from, from Darndale right across the tomb, we don't have uh, anything in the programme north of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something I'm just mindful of at the minute, that, uh, that we do have a, you know, a fairly even geographic spread as well. Uh, so something that we, we will watch in the future for sure. That's but based great. on applications. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll gladly promote it when the next call goes out. And um, thanks so much for coming and sharing about this, this programme. Um, I didn't see any hands up, but you, yeah, I, I might get some emails afterwards. I might be forwarding on. Um, so uh, thanks so much, Sinead. So next up, we have Anya, Anya Crowley. So Anya is from CREATE. So again, if you are unfamiliar with the work of CREATE, they're a national development agency for collaborative arts. Their work initiates cross-sectoral national and international partnerships, which supports artists and communities to co-create work of depth, ambition, and excellence. Their mission is to lead the development of collaborative arts practice by enabling artists and communities to create exceptional art together. The Arts Council's Artist and Community Scheme managed, is managed by CREATE and it offers awards to enable artists and communities of place and or interest to work together on projects. Um, so I only if you want to uh, maybe yeah. uh, take it away there. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I just have to comment on Joanna's um, piece there. It's beautiful. It's also beautiful. But um, so this is like, um, I suppose, a real speedy tour around the artists and the community scheme. But I'm just going to ground and ground it in a little bit about CREATE um, as a, an organization that might be of interest to you. And, and I think I suppose I suppose the scheme also really kind of holds the principles of collaborative practice as well. So, so you can't do one without the other. I'm going to take it that nobody knows who we are so so and and I suppose perhaps everyone's new to collaborative practice I always go with that kind of lens so I'll just kick off so a little bit about create so we're the so we're the national development agency for collaborative arts as a resource organization we provide advice and support services to artists and also arts organizations who work collaboratively with communities in both social and community context so these include a number of things um, professional development opportunities project development commissioning mentoring project opportunities, and also various research and training. I'm not going to go through other programs that we have, but I'd really recommend that people have a look at our website. You'll find out more about the Creative Places Tune program that Sinead highlighted there, but also there's some great resources like Beyond the Now um, and other, um, other, say, other programs that we're involved in terms of partnering on as well. So it's a great resource. 
also I, I would recommend that people look at our strategy it's just it really I suppose it really it goes through our strategic goals and I suppose what underpins the work that we do and offers I suppose a, a better sense of I suppose for the vision of the vision of create but um but so we manage the artists in the community scheme in a devolved basis for the arts council so it's an arts council scheme so what the scheme does, it offers support to artists um, who want to work with communities and we'd often, you'd often hear say of interest in place, but it supports projects in all corners of the country. Um, I suppose it's no harm for us to kind of go into, you know, like when we say community, we mean it in the broadest sense. There's been like communities in terms of place, there's been groups in Kerry, in Shone, Dublin, the islands, um, in tiny towns, big towns, cities. Um, so in all corners, it's in neighborhoods, um, but in terms of interest, there's been farmers, there's been divers, there's been pigeon fanciers, chess club players, beekeepers, punks, working fishermen, also projects happening in various health contexts, such as with breast cancer survivors, LGBT groups, asylum seekers. So I suppose I'm, we mean community in the most broadest sense, but I suppose the only thing what it's not it's not a group of artists. So it's not a group of artists who are coming together as a community. Um, However, more than one artist might be collaborating with the community. Um, so oh, after having a bit of a freeze, ah, now we go. Um, I suppose before we go into the details of the scheme, it's also important that we look at collaborative arts. So I'm just going to go into Create's interpretation of it, and it's also on, on our strategy as well. So what we say that collaborative arts practice involves artists and communities working closely together, um, often over extended periods of time to make art. So the work is durational. It harnesses the experiences and skills of each person taking part to give meaning and creative expression for what's important in their lives. By facilitating wider participation, collaborative arts expands and diversify public engagement with arts, um, enriching its contribution to society. So we would say that collaborative practice all, um, often contests the notion of authorship. So who owns the work? It's not just the artists. The work often happens outside the typical gallery space so, um, or outside the typical theatre space. So it could be on beaches, it could be on streets, it could be uh, in, in homes. And it's often just interdisciplinary. So we might have a musician working with an architect, a visual artist working with a dancer, so on and so forth. I suppose, um, I suppose at the core of collaborative practice is co-creation, um, democratic decision making. So that there's multiple voices evident in the project. Um, a lot of the time the, pro the, the projects are based on issues or themes that are really reflect the people and their everyday lives. Um, and, and I suppose often we see that there's new communities who are engaging with the, the, the scheme. So it's often communities who may not normally engage with the arts. Um, so it's a, I suppose ultimately what we often find is a lot of the projects are, are very much driven by the community and have a purpose and a meaning to the community along with the artistic practice as well. So just this is like almost like the, the uh, for the want of a better word, like the umbrella of the artists in the community scheme. So a lot happens within the scheme. So you'll see in the orange there, this is the advice and um, support services. So if anyone's interested in engaging in the scheme, we offer information sessions, we off offer application support. That, so that could be one-to-one -one, um, with myself um, or one of my colleagues. There's also if someone's awarded, we offer project support. So we would meet with the artists in the community um, or lead organization to go through anything that's coming up. And there's also Professional development opportunities. So I suppose we're always reflecting on reports that artists put in and communities submit so that we can see what are the needs of the communities. So within the scheme, there's um, technically we'll, we'll say within the AIC scheme awards, three awards. So there's research and development and project realization, but we also offer a bursary award. There's two bursary rounds each year. Also, some of you might be aware of the strand of work which became known as Cultural Diversity Strand, which um, we'll just I'll touch off these in a bit, which offered re offers residency awards and also school and collaborative practice and cultural diversity. So also, and I suppose what's ultimately really important is that this is a cycle. There's lots of research, lots of, lots of reflective practice happening um, and feeding back into the programme, both of ourselves, but also with the artists and communities that we work with. So with the, the scheme itself, so... So we'll just right now we'll speak to the research and development award and the project realization. So twice yearly, the scheme offers um, uh, the awards. So 
Um, the deadlines are usually in March and around September time. So the next one is actually this month. So, so the scheme enables artists and communities, and I, I, I say this on repeat, who the communities are who are non-arts professionals. So they apply for funding to work together on projects. It's open to artists working across art forms. And I've said more, more than one artist can apply. So the scheme offers a good example of the principles of collaborative practice, cl working collaboratively with communities. So the aim of the scheme is to encourage meaningful collaboration. Um, the scheme supports projects that values the creative contribution of all collaborators while providing opportunity for artistic challenge. Um, I suppose we would always say that it's really essential that consultation takes place between the artists and the community group, particularly when developing a project realization award so that both parties are really involved in deciding the nature of the project. Um, and we and this will lead me into the priorities of the award now, but I suppose proposals must ensure that the artistic quality, but also the quality of, of engagement between the artists and collaborators are considered at all stages. So when I say that, that's in the planning, the making, the presenting, even the evaluation of the work. Um, and we'd always say the group ownership must be maintained at every stage. So I'm just going to briefly go through the, the objectives and priorities of the award. These are all on our website um, under the guidelines of the AIC scheme. Um, but we say that um, the, the guidelines would say the proposals should demonstrate a clear description of methodologies for engagement and collaboration um, that value the creative contribution of all collaborators while providing opportunities for artistic challenge. I actually think I'm going to be repeating myself here, but anyway, um, support the inclusion of multiple voices as part of the project's identity and decision making process. Um, so for argument's sake, if there's a lead organization, that it's not just the lead organization, the artists, how are the voices of those who are actually collaborating with the artists? How is that evident? So again, here ensure that the artistic quality and quality engagement um, between the artists and collaborators are considered at all stages. And also they must, show, or they must demonstrate active support and commitment from all collaborators and partners and organizational clarity, including, I suppose, a clear understanding of people's roles and the contribution that they will give to the project. I suppose a lot of these projects don't just happen between an artist and the community. There's also other parts of an ecosystem there that supports it. And the final um, point there, I suppose, this speaks to the trace. So what does the project leave behind? What happens after the timeline of the project? And I suppose that's something we would always kind of talk to in terms of collaboration collaborative practice that it's um it's all well and good to engage with the community but but what if you, when you leave what's going to happen you don't want to leave a vacuum um so that can be as that that can be damaging and I suppose that all that consideration of how how what happens beyond the project lifetime so so we'll drill down some specifics so the research and development award so the purpose of the R&D is to support proposals from the artist so the artist applies so an artist who wishes to collaborate artistically with a community and the idea is that we, the R&D was introduced to the scheme to provide opportunity for an artist to explore test out an idea um, and also to undertake the preliminary development of a project in a social or community context then the project realization award so the purpose um i suppose this is to support proposals from communities um or perhaps their lead organization who want to collaborate artistically with an artist so ultimately this is community led so it's the community who leads out in this application um some of you might have written a, a aic application before you will see that there's a section for the artists in the community they they write it together but it's 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 community led um so I think what's really important, I suppose, in terms of the Project Realization Award, the voice of the collaborating community members is so critical and must be evident in the application. Because unfortunately, we do say, see amazing projects where an organization and an artist have a, a, an incredible vision for something, but actually the, the actual individuals um, have not been considered. Um, so, so oh, we're not moving. What's happening here? Um, so in terms of the, the award amounts, um, so, so with the r and it's, um, it's 2,500 for an artist to research and develop the idea, and the maximum time frame is six months. This can be done in a month, in, in, in two months, it can be done over the six months. Um, so there's also research and development with mentoring, so that's um, an additional 1,000 euros for an artist to engage with a professional artist. Um, who will mentor the artist. So this is about the, the artist needs. So perhaps someone who might be new to collaborative practice um, would like to develop a project with a community. So they may choose an artist who has a strong collaborative practice to journey with them. So the, the, the mentor technically, while they do support the project, their primary goal is to support the, the, the lead artist. 
So then there's the there's also re recent graduate award, with, which has additional money, but also project realization um, is fifteen thousand. I would say to people, apply for the 15,000, no less than the 15,000, because that money gets spent very quickly. Um, and, and we do see projects, people apply for less, but I would always be encouraging people to go apply for the full amount. So the timeline is eight to 12 months. Um, so for, for the project realization, and then there's the, the bursary award, which the value of the, so there's two bursary rounds, um, with one award um, in each round, and that's 10,000. I suppose what's important to point out, what it's not. So the scheme won't support proposals for the, where the applicants, as I said earlier, would have a really great idea, but need participants to populate it, as opposed to, I suppose, those looking to plan and develop the project from beginning to end in collaboration with the community. So I'm just going to touch off briefly about the bursary because we have a bursary deadline coming up. Um, I know it may not be applicable to everybody here, but um, but we, we offer it in different contexts yearly. So the primary focus of a burst reward is the artist. So the exploration development of the artist collaborative practice. So it's not a project. Um, traditionally, the scheme offered only one burst reward, but and that would be in a different art form, so or a different context. So collaborative arts and health or collaborative arts and dance. Um, so so this year, um, with the last couple of years, we have two bursaries. So one first bursary is focused specifically in the area of collaborative arts and cultural diversity, and the second one is um, collaborative arts and dance. And we actually have an information session tomorrow. And um, so if anybody's interested, um, please go onto our website and do book, or if you know anybody, please send them to our website. I suppose it's important to note that there is only one bursary reward in each round. And it's, I suppose it's quite specific, the IC bursaries are. So it's for an artist with a track record of working collaboratively, but it's also the artist needs to have a track record in the context of which the, the bursary has been awarded. For argument's sake, if it was arts and health contact, context, I suppose it's not for someone to be dipping their toes into that um, area. So it's, um, in terms of the bursary, as I said, it's 10,000. What it does, it really, I suppose, provides the selected artists with the time and resources to carry out research, reflect and engage with their practice. Um, and also to consider key questions associated with the collaborative methodologies. Um, also, I think what's important just to kind of go, what's the difference again, is that because this is what it's a recurring issue is that while a bursary award may include collaborative arts workshops or project elements, it's not to deliver a project. So the primary focus of a bursary is not a project, but that's where I suppose a project realization award that um that it might be of more interest. Um, I'm just gonna touch off some of the other elements of our program because I think I'm it might give you a little nudge on you. <laughs> yeah, 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 perfect. Um, so I suppose over the last five years, Create have been working very closely with the Arts Council in developing an additional strand of our work, which has become known as Cultural Diversity Strand. So there's two artist residencies within that. If you're interested, please look at them. But these were artist residency awards were specifically to support an artist from minority ethnic background or an artist with first hand experience of displacement or um, who has been shaped by histories of gen uh, generational migration. So so two are actually a, um, a play at present. But if you're interested, please do connect with me if you want to talk further about that. Ultimately, they're not about production, but they're about artistic development. But we also run a school on collaborative arts and cultural diversity. And again, there's loads of information on our website about that. And then finally, our up and coming deadlines. <laughs> um, I feel like it's the AIC on speed here. It's like, poof. Um, so we have a deadline on the 26th of September for round two, which includes R&D and project realization. And as I said, the bursary award, which is information session is tomorrow. The next deadline is the 17th of um, October. So that is me. It's very fast. And I know my cock accent, I go faster. So I do apologize to people. <laughs> that's that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Anya. And again, I don't see any hands up, but if you do just yell out or drop your question in the chat afterwards or just go along to the information session tomorrow, I guess, as well, you know, where you can probably ask in more detail. Thank you so much, Anya. That's just fascinating. I'm going to move on to John because we don't have a huge amount of time left, but um, I just want to, you know, this scheme is it's kind of tried and tested scheme that's been running for a number of years now. So for community, I know we've got a number of community representatives that I recognize in the in the in the chat in the attendee attending. So just like really do check it out. It is a very fantastic, it's a fantastic scheme with lots of different opportunities to engage. Um, so finally, we have um, John Flynn from the SEAI. Um, so the SEAI are working with homeowners, businesses, communities and government to transform how we think about generation use energy. Um, during our work with communities around Ireland, um, 
we regularly have communities who are looking at their architectural infrastructure from an energy perspective. So I guess we're looking more at the bricks and mortar type of, of community assets now, but I mean, it's it's particularly as communities are looking at their carbon foot, footprint, they're looking at um, adaptive reuse of space, and they're just looking at, you know, what do they want for the future of the communities? I have heard communities mention um, the SEAI as being a very supportive partners or funders or project, you know, being involved in their projects. So um, it's, it's, a, it's on a very different scale to some of the projects we've been discussing so far, and also in a different part of, of of I guess cultural production something that both ends really um architects operate across a, a number of scales and a number of methodologies but something that we find um is is architects who have this adaptive skill to look at the bricks and mortar as well as the human interaction with place and space okay I, I won't go on any further but I'll just introduce uh John now if you want to share your screen and give us an introduction to the community uh grants that you run Okay, can, is that coming up for you there? Uh, we can, no, not quite yet. We'll give you a second though. Has it come up? No, um, I think we were, if you want, we can try sharing, John, or, oh wait, no, or, yeah. do you want to try it one more time and then we can share your screen or we can share the presentation? Is it doing anything there? Um, not quite. Nicola, do you have it handy there? Can you? No. <laughs> okay. One second. Um, this is where we play the holding music. It's working now. Has it worked? It's working there now. Yeah. That's super. Thank you. Just was trying to hold okay. it there. Um, off you go there, John. Okay, sorry about that. Um, no, I'll stop sharing my video just because I my Wi-Fi is not particularly strong. Um, okay, so uh, SCI, so our remit is to look at energy and energy efficiency and provide schemes that uh, support uh, government, homeowners, businesses, and our, our community generally. Um, so we have a number of different schemes that run in various different uh, different areas. Um, the community scheme is one of uh, these. Uh, the scheme is aimed at uh, supporting communities um, to, 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 to do stuff effectively. Um, we'll try and touch on what it looks and feels like, uh, where to go to get some, some support, what measures can be done, how do you apply, and uh, what an application looks and feels like, although I don't think many people will be actually be putting an application through themselves. So just uh, the genesis is that we're trying to engage uh, communities, and that means everybody. Um, we, we tried holding this as being um, a, a geographical narrow uh, application. When an application comes to us, it would be geographically narrow. And we've, we've thrown that out because it just, just, just doesn't work. Um, so we want a cross-sectoral approach for an application coming forward. Uh, what we're looking for is projects from 50 up to 5 million. Now that's 50,000 euro of grant, up to 5 million euro worth of grant, which effectively means that the application uh, of project works is about 150,000 to about 20 million. And that's the scale of uh, uh, projects that we could, could look at. Um, for homes uh, and those who are involved in either doing retrofits or extensions and all that kind of weird, wonderful stuff, the grant values are fixed. Uh, for non-domestic works, which is everything that's not a home. Um, it depends on what you're doing. Um, we can support anything and everything and set up to very, very large projects. Uh, just to give a scale, last year we had 25 contracts. Uh, grant support was about 18 million of that. That supported works of about 70 million. We did about 600 homes and we did 240 non-domestic uh, buildings. And I'll touch on what non-domestic means uh, later on. So the scheme is aimed at engaging everybody. So domestic, public, private, uh, and uh, community buildings. So it's everything, absolutely. There's nothing in and nothing out. Um, so it's very generic. And the works that we do are also 
very generic. So a solution for a public building might be a solution for um, the local hotel. So the, the technologies are quite repetitive from our perspective. The supports that are available for domestic, as I said, they're fixed in line with the one-stop shop, which came out of the Climate Action Plan. For public and private sector buildings, 30%. Community buildings can get 50%, subject to some clarifications, but they'll definitely be given 30% as a starting point. So domestic measures, you'd expect the standard stuff. So um, walls, roofs, floors, windows, heat pumps, uh, solar heating, PV systems, ventilation, all of those, and putting yourself on the, the journey by getting a uh, home energy assessment. That will be uh, grant supported as well. So I've put up a couple of pictures here just so as you get a feel for the type of things we do. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, I heard of the scheme, but actually, no, I've never seen it in action. You have, uh, you have, but you just didn't realize um, most of the multiple retailers uh, have um, done work. So Tesco's, Musgraves, done stores, hotels, ma use massive energy, ma massive energy users. Most of those have been to us looking at cooling, heating, uh, and uh, lighting uh, as well, and looking at their, their infrastructure in, in some instances. Public buildings then, we do all sorts of public buildings, including uh, the fire brigade, but not for that, you know, we don't buy uh, fire brigade uh, trucks like that one. Uh, we do do their buildings, uh, and believe it or not, fire brigade men get very wet when they're on site, and they need a huge amount of drying of the equipment when it comes back in. Um, so we do significant volumes of uh, public sector se sector buildings. In relation to um, non-profit uh, making organizations, so we do a huge amount with the GAA in terms of pitch lighting. Um, EV charges is a, is a thing that's coming up and we do water heating and their buildings. Uh, for community, generally we do community halls, churches, all that kind, kind of uh, topography, topography of building. We will do all of that type of building and sports facilities. We're doing Musrave Park, for example, which is uh, flood lighting of the pitch uh, to both um, support uh, games in the evening and also to reduce their energy bills. The start point for any of this, people saying, oh, I have a project, where's the start? You should have an energy audit, which the, the energy audit tells us um, what equipment you're using, uh, the types of energy you're using, be it gas, oil, or electricity, and the technologies that you're using. Is it heating of water, cooling of areas, uh, refrigeration, um, air quality, all of these type of things are looked at. From the energy audit, then the auditor should be in a position to advise you about changes to reduce energy. Um, once, the, once you have your energy audit, um, you're, you're in a start point and the, the energy auditor um, should make recommendations to as to which is the best bang for buck uh, items uh, to start with. Now you can get an energy audit funded through SCAI. It's a different department to my own, but it, there are grants available. Uh, so if anybody has a building that you're looking at and you'd like to know, uh, like to get an energy audit done, you'll get a voucher to go off and, and do that. If you look at our the SCAI website, it, it's certainly there. And so to get you at the start position should cost you very little for small buildings. It certainly will fully fund the energy audit. For larger buildings, large manufacturing sites, certainly if you're talking about millions of euros of projects, um, it's the, the grant available for the audit won't cover the entirety of the energy audit, but would go a significantly long way towards paying a considerable portion of it. So if you have a project, how do you apply? Well, we don't recommend you apply on your own just because uh, the nature of the scheme is quite broad. It is better to use a project coordinator, a project coordinator in your area. We have a list of project coordinators on our website. Have a look at those. Uh, these guys are more than keen to get applications through and projects through. 
they'll try and keep them in a geographical area if possible. The first thing they'll ask you for is, have you done an energy audit? Um, and when you, if you have an energy audit, as I said, you're, you're already halfway um, to looking at it. Uh, the project coordinator will then look to try and fit you in to a scheme. So as the administration of making a, an application should be removed from you. The timescale for delivery is about 12 months from contract award. As I've said, the, the grants are between uh, you know, 50,000 euro up to 5 million euro, but that means works of 100,000 up to 20 million is the biggest project we currently have. And the scheme is available all year round. Uh, so typically we won't take any applications after say October, just because we're trying to wash out the year, but up to uh, applications normally come in from December all the way through till September. And it's fairly flexible as to the technologies that we would consider. We've done everything from grass machines uh, on an international football pitch to um, anaerobic digestion uh, on a community farm. So there's my uh, contact details there. If anybody has any queries or questions or would like to be put in contact with anybody who might look at these type of projects, we're more than keen to, to try and help you along uh, in participating in the scheme. That's it from me. That's super. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Um, and again, it's been it's great to have um again looking at the more kind of um bigger ticket um projects that communities are looking at and are thinking about um that uh you know require more um yeah <laughs> bigger input in terms of funding. I don't think anyone had any questions at all. No, nothing came into the chat there for anyone. So you just can contact the speakers directly if you do, or you can contact us again, or you can rewatch the videos back. We're going to put this on our on our website. Um, I'll let you go in a second, but just as we're winding up, um, I'm going to share in the chat. Um, we have a couple of things coming up. Um, so the IAF is going to the Ploughing Championships. So we'll be there next week with an exhibition as part of our Reimagine program. Please come and say hi because um, <laughs> it's a it's a it's a it's a special exhibition that we're bringing. It's a part of our Workers Villages program. So it's with the communities that are in the Workers Villages around Ireland that were built in the 1950s for the Border Mono workers. And we're going to have some of our community members there speaking about their experiences living in the communities and presenting about their the unique architecture designed by by Frank Gibney that they live in. And um, so that's going to be uh, the middle of next week. Um, and then on the 1st of October, we're going to be in Galway and um, we will be at the uh, Michelore Festival of Nomadic Cultures. And uh, we are going to be presenting a session on nomadic placemaking, which is really exciting for us. We're going to look at um, a, a different perspectives, arch architecture and the built environment from the perspective of uh, traveller culture and indigenous identities. And um, so we have Dr. Cindy Joyce will be speaking at that and own, own the Bardoon as well, who's a, a curator of traveller cultures in the um, National Museum of Ireland. Um, and those are just a couple of things that we have coming up. Uh, yeah, Evan will be there at the ploughing as well. <laughs> so you can come and say hi to her as well. She's one of our architects. Um, is there anything else anyone wants to raise your hand about or ask questions on? Or actually, particularly, if you have funds that you'd like to hear about in the future, you can email us and we can programme another session like this in another few months. Um, so those are things you'd love to hear about. No? OK, and maybe keep your ears peeled in about maybe five or six weeks. We'll have a, an announcement about our own um, reimagine program as well, about an open call that will be going out in autumn. Um, that's great. Thank you so much, Anya and John and Sinead is gone. But um, thank you so much. Bye now, everyone. See you. Bye bye. Thank you, Brandy.